has no mercy. <laughs> So I've become much more, um, I think I've learned and I'm learning how to tend and befriend the falling apart and the coming back together. Because in the end, um, that, is the, that is a pattern of life. And to resist that pattern, um, usually for me, has created uh, behaviors that I have to end up um, facing um, in ways that uh, cause me great pain and other people. And so to realize that it comes together and it falls apart, and it comes back together again, um, there's a rhythm of that that's deeply comforting to me. So if you're uh, in the falling apart pattern of that, then uh, welcome. <laughs> if you're in the uh, it's coming back together part, welcome. The great thing is that both of y'all will trade places pretty soon, so. Uh, <laughs> it's just a 
<laughs> it's just like that, and it's just like that. I think um, I think I become interested in the edges of uh, both um, culture because I become really interested in the edges of myself, uh, and to realize that uh, many times we create edges in our community and our society, we other things because we don't know what to do, um, we don't know how to befriend those things that we end up othering, and I think if um, if there is any type of spirituality that is um, that I'm attracted towards. It's the type of spirituality, uh, in the words of Antonio, uh, Antonio Machicado, who is a wonderful Spanish poet, who says all the words of Jesus can be summed up in the one word, wake up, wake up. And so spirituality at its very core for me is a process of waking up. And that's a long process, folks, at least for me it has been. It is, uh, a long process. There are parts of my life even today that are deeply committed to being asleep, to being anesthetized, to not waking up, even amid other parts of my life that are awake, right? And that's the, that's the for me, the, um, the complicatedness of being a human. I make up a lot of words, so if, there's, if, if you've got a dictionary out, then um, you're, you're going to feel kind of screwed today because I'll just make words up. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what giving you a PhD does, is you can make words up and be like, that doesn't sound like a word, but uh, maybe it is. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but in the complicatedness of our lives, um, we wake up and then we are also deeply committed to not being awake. And what it means to be human, I think, is to live in that polarity and in those dichotomies and in that, um, that type of structure. And I'm deeply um, curious and fascinated by folks that are committed to being awake. Bill Curley um, is committed to being awake. He's, he's nuts, but he's awake. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he provides, what I love about uh, Bill, is he provides other folks like me uh, the place of being, becoming awake. And coming awake doesn't, um, it's not always pretty. It's never pretty. It means that you come to yourself in ways that um, um, the unconscious become conscious. Those which uh, things in your life, in my life, that I've had to sublimate in order to survive become unsublimated and they create a tension that uh, creates conflict, deep conflict. And so I think what I'm attracted to in folks like um, Bill Curley, folks like Michael Lerner, who will be here next week, are folks that have um, learned how to create context in their own life and the way that they live, move, and have their being in the world in ways that allow other folks like myself and yourself to wake up in ways that are deeply messy because that's the only way to wake up. And so as we wake up together and as we realize that parts of us are asleep, um, welcome. It's just like that. It's just like I wish I could do magic tricks now, but I don't have any of that, so. <laughs> I think this is the part where you do magic tricks, but I, I am woefully unprepared. Um, <laughs> um, what a miracle. So that's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You're all, yeah, that's going to be terrible if I try that. Um, I've been interested for a long time in how people change and sustain change. I was I promised early on in a spiritual life growing up in the suburbs of Dallas, Texas, for a spirituality that would produce a change if I believed in certain things. If I gave myself to a discrete belief system, then certain things would happen and not happen, right? And so as a young child growing up in uh, that, um, uh, really, which was a hyper-management um, system, trying to manage and to control uh, the, the reality, uh, belief was a part of that. And so what I believe cognitively then created a structure in the world and um, out of that good people happen and bad people happen. Good things happen and bad things happen. And they could all be kind of somehow fit into a matrix of this belief. And I could tell um, and I could figure out if bad things were happening is because I didn't believe enough or believe the right things. 
And so conversion became about um, trying to convince people to believing more elegant thoughts about God, my elegant thoughts about God. So you being converted, converted was to be converted to my way of thinking, right? To the right way of thinking. That has created much violence in the world, much division in the world. We see it happening and playing out in our world today, much division. Conversion at its very point is this word in the Greek called metanoia, which really means a paradigm shift. It means uh, looking at uh, something one way and then uh, having an experience that opens up the horizon, and you think, oh, oh, that's how it is, right? Um, I was trying to uh, uh, explain this to my son, who just turned 16 this uh, uh, yesterday, uh, a couple weeks ago, we are talking about perception, and so I showed him that old picture of, of, uh, of the rabbit and the duck, yeah, and I asked him, what do you see? He's like, it's a duck, Dad, it's a duck, you know, like, duh. As every 15 and 16 year old, you're the dumbest man in the world. It's a duck. And so I began to show him maybe there's another way of seeing this. Because I said, I see a rabbit. He's like, there's no rabbit there. Right? He's committed to seeing the duck. And um, I did for him what other people have done for me, which is to show him another way of seeing. And it blew his mind. Right? You, you, I don't know if you can remember, um, even in just perception, those things that end up blowing your mind. The world is not as small as we can see. And so to um, open up our minds, to have a metanoia, whatever spirituality is to do in the world, it is to open us up, to wake us up. Um, and I, um, I thank God for uh, the type of spirituality that... Um, Bill Curley invests in, that this class invests in, that wakes us up into the world. That's not given to discrete belief systems that draw lines in the sand and it says everybody that's good to come on this side of the line. Um, that we're given to, um, to each other in this place of waking up. So um, over the years I have been really interested in how people wake up, how people change. Um, and I planted a church a uh, feels like a hundred years ago, it was definitely another lifetime ago, called Mercy Street, the chapel of United Methodist Church. And I was really interested in how people um, who didn't have a conceived spirituality, who had left the church, still were spiritual. Because I grew up in a context where if you left the church, you left spirituality, because we had it, right? Uh, and so conversion was kind of like, we've got it, you want it, how about it, you know? Uh, and I began to realize that there was a generosity of spirituality that had been poured out uh, uh, on this planet. And that I was trapped in a smaller story. And so these folks that I was meeting, many of whom uh, struggled with addictions, who began to gently but resolutely show me the places in my own behavior that were caught up and committed to being asleep. And these folks were committed to waking up. And because of that, they were committed to change. And so I got really interested in how people change and sustain change. And so in my own dissertation, I studied a group of women that were um, deeply traumatized through physical violence, sexual abuse. And they had integrated that in a really different way. They changed. They had all lived on the streets, all sold their bodies as commodities to put food on the table for their children. And they were living very different lives in the present moment. And I began to wonder, how, how does that happen? How do people change? How do people move from a place um, where they are defined by behaviors, where end up behaviors end up defining them, and how do they get released um, from those places? And so if I studied this, if I sat on the couch of my own therapy and my own spiritual director, Bill and I share the same spiritual director. We call her an ass-kicking nun. And, uh, <laughs> And every time I leave her office, I kind of want to say to her, you're so mean, but you're so right. <laughs> you know? And what I've understood underneath um, this, uh, this question of change is really this question of stuckness. And so I want to talk today just in a brief amount of time of, um, 
uh, on being unstuck. Because the question that comes up for me um, um, in, in all of this is, where are you stuck? Where are you stuck to? I thought about having us kind of turn towards each other and share those things. <laughs> Because I don't think we get unstuck until we get really honest and vulnerable, right? I think unstuckness comes at it with a price of our own humility. humility. Um, and for me, humiliation and humility are deeply connected. <laughs> I wish they weren't, but they are. <laughs> um, and so um, um, I, I think that if I were to hand you a journal and say, where are you stuck today? to give you a, a couple of moments and then ask you to write. My hunch is, is that each of us would be able to write um, probably quite um, at length. If we could suck all the shame out of this room and maybe the fear of being exposed, and we were able to turn knee to knee and to share those places in our own life where we are stuck, my hunch is, is that we could identify a couple of places right now. Me just saying, where are you stuck? There's something that comes up for us. Some of those things are deeply painful even this morning. Conversations we've had with a lover, partner, conversations we don't have. Behaviors that we keep deeply private and hope that they will go away one day. Things that we've done and undone, things that we've said and unsaid, things that we cannot undo. And so it's been um, really in um, the room with Sister Lois and then another person I've never met, but I've had a long conversation with this person through his books, James Hollis. And Hollis was over at the Young Center for years. He wrote about 15,000 books. I don't, know if he's, uh, I don't know if he's ever had a thought. He has not uh, published. Uh, um, and I'm grateful for that. If you've not read his book, The um, Living the Exam in Life, I commend it to you. It's fantastic. So much of what I have to offer you this morning comes out of my conversations with Bill Curley, comes out of my conversations with Jim Hollis, comes out of my conversations and being water board by my spiritual director, Sister Lois. <laughs> so it's easy to identify the places we're stuck in, right? Uh, the question I have many times is, we can bring those to mind, but why is it so difficult to get unstuck? Why is it so difficult to get unstuck? For a millennial, uh, millennium, humans have often recognized that we are our own worst enemies. For most of humanity, the same problems keep showing up again and again and again. It's uh, this cycle. In your own life and in my own life, it's not that I get really creative about my problems. I have the same problems. They manifest themselves in different ways, but they really are the same problems. They could be about power control. They could be about shame. They could be about constriction over anxiety. They're really not that creative. Now they manifest themselves in a thousand different faces. I think about um, Paul, who wrote uh, in Romans, who observes the good that he wants to do, but he often cannot, does not do it. And this one word over this whole passage, I think, in Paul's life is about stuckness. About why. Why am I stuck? How do I get unstuck? Why do I do these things? He employs this uh, Greek word, akrasia, which really translates into this sense of having a damaged will, a, a dilatory will, uh, something that you intend to do, your deepest intentions. I began to um, meditate about four or five years ago. There's a woman by the name of Tara Brock. If you don't know her, she's fantastic. I mean, she is, uh, she is a Buddhist teacher that has um, taught me more about um, my own faith than any um, person in the last uh, four or five years. Taught me how to meditate. And there's a, a sense in which as I bring to these, and to my own life intentions, these intentions that I have to, to be awake, there is also, I'm also um, confronted with another power within myself that's deeply committed to me not being awake, this damaged will, this insufficient intention. Why then, if 
these places embarrass us, if they hurt us, if they spill over into others' lives in ways that we don't want, why can't we will more? Why can't we resolve more? James Hollis says it like this. We may be sure that there, if there is a stuck place in our life, we will have a sore toe from stubbing it. And that a complex is built up around this contentious and tender place. Now we can, of course, mobilize more will and try to push through it. And sometimes that proves effective if we're able to push through it. But most of the time, we realize that our stuckness um, is persistent. And that persistent even prevails. I have a person, a friend of mine in, uh, who's uh, in AA that says whenever he goes to a meeting, he realizes that his attic is out in the parking lot doing push-ups. You know? <laughs> and I felt like that in marriage counseling. I felt like that in every place that um, I have attempted to look at unconscious behavior in my life or with another person, that when I step out of that place, I realize that my will has been out in the parking lot doing push-ups, going, all right, let's do this, right? <laughs> that there is another power um, that is present uh, in those things. We've all experienced these things. Uh, there are two principles that I want to suggest that come out of depth psychology and out of spiritual direction that I find to be quite helpful in understanding uh, the stuck places and becoming unstuck. And what I mean by depth psychology is what I mean by that, um, that there's a depth to us that we don't necessarily understand and realize. <coughs> that our behaviors um, and the, why we do the things that we don't want to do aren't always readily available to us. Right? We can ask the why question, but it's not as if there's just an easy answer that pops up. And depth psychology says that there's more to you than you understand. It's the Jahari window, right? There are things that you um, don't know that you know, but there are things that you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> and those things that you don't know that you don't know, they have a tendency in our lives to create complexes and to create motivations and to create energy in our lives because they are very committed and not being known. And so depth psychology suggests that there are two principles that we must become aware of. These two principles, it's not what it is about. It's the first thing about our stubbornness. And then what we see is a compensation for what we don't see. So it's not what it's about. Uh, pick, pick something in your life that you struggle with. Why do I do the things I don't want to do? It can have to do with exercise or anger or food or pornography or being out of control in areas of, of our lives. Why do I do these things? Well, it's not what you think it's about. It's what depth psychology will tell us. And that really these things that we create in our life is a compensation for what we don't see. This first principle, it is not what it is about. It tells us that the place of stuckness is not what it appears to be. So what then is it about? I think about common resolve that we uh, end up colluding with, usually around the first of the year, about changing behavior, right? I'm going to start working out. I'm going to quit eating donuts. I'm going to meditate every morning. We find these efforts so easily frustrated. Why are these efforts so easily set aside? I mean, let's take eating, for example. Um, most of our eating is driven by in, uh, invisible agendas. The nutrient needs of the psyche, the hungers of the flesh and spirit. And the more concrete the need, the more easily understood, the more abstract the need, the more elusive. I mean, if food were just about food, you and I could weigh and measure our food. We could count calories rather easily, and we could kind of quit eating when we are full or when we know our bodies have had enough. I've got my fitness pal on my, uh, uh, on my phone. I get it, right? And I go to my son's uh, party yesterday with a big chocolate cake that just makes a fool out of me, <laughs> right? I'm only going to eat half of it. That's all I'm going to eat, right? 
And I'm in rocking back and forth in my car in shame afterwards, you know. <laughs> That's not, that was a true thing that happened to me. <laughs> Now, food is an animated matter, though, right? It's animated. And matter derives from this word in Latin, mater, where we get the word mother. Where we understand what we're longing for is the source of all um, that we long for. The source of all that um, gets nurtured inside of us, that which gets fed, feeds us, and that which uh, meets our needs the most. And so often then we project onto raw material our own emotional and social needs. It's more than just food. Food becomes love, it becomes continuity, it becomes ready presence in our life. And no matter how difficult our day has been, we can come home and we can open up the fridge and the lights come on and it's just like there's a soundtrack. Whoa! Right? There it is, love of home. Welcome to love, right? <laughs> and this is just one of the ways of uh, understanding um, eating disorders in our culture. Bulimia. The way that we um, eat through all food, the way we starve ourselves with anorexia. That these nutrients get connected to this deep psychological functions within ourselves that we're longing for, that we hunger for. They collude and get connected there. And these disorders really are um, hyper-management efforts in a world that is beyond our control. Just like religion is a hyper-management system in a world that is beyond our control, so is our um, connections to food or sex or power or serial relationships or anything in our lives that we say, why do I do this? These hyper-management efforts, I think they're a plaintive cry that there's never going to be enough, enough love, enough nurturance, enough reassurance, enough security. And so these hyper-management efforts become quite available to us. This is how I understand addiction. This is how I understand my own addictive processes as hyper-management efforts in a world beyond our control. What uh, St. Ignatius calls disordered attachments. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Makes me feel a little less crazy, too. <laughs> These disordered attachments that we have that end up creating this hyper-management system to control the out-of-controlness that we feel in our world. And I think these attachments, these management s systems are really surrogate, uh, are surrogates to the spirit in our life. They, they, they promise numinous. They promise that spark. They promise to protect. They promise to nurture. But the places that we get stuck in the most and we stub our toe in the most and then we build complexes around the most, those are the places that in these hyper-management systems promise to relieve us. And I think that's why it is so terrifying in the end to have to admit powerlessness, that these systems are not working. It's not just the relationship between um, um, our spouse or our lover or our partner or our friends are not working. The way that we have constructed our life, the systems out of which we have built our own lives are not working. Now, I don't have to just turn on the TV this week to realize that something mm -hmm. is deeply broken within the management systems of our culture and our world. I don't have to just drive five miles from here and head into Golden, where two thirds of every single student will show up hungry in an HISD campus tomorrow. Actually, two. Something's broken. Our hypermanagement systems are not working. But like the emperor who has no clothes, we collude in these systems. As Monty Python says, my one of my spirit, favorite um, spiritual resources, 
It's nearly a flesh wound. <laughs> As our arms cut off and we're spewing blood out. It's nearly a flesh wound. <laughs> And so these hypermanagement systems, whether they have to do with food or power, is not just about food or power. It's interesting to me that we can identify these places, but it's deeply difficult to then begin to uncover the invisibility of the mechanisms that actually run our lives. And this is the work of what it means to be human, folks. Any spirituality, any atheism, any non-spirituality that's worth its work in this world will give us, press us to the types of resources that we need to uncover the invisible systems that actually are in operation in our lives. Paula suggests that under each stuck place that there's a wire that runs deep into the resources, the archaic fields of our very being activates a field of anxiety out of which we are deeply unaware but has enough power to reinforce any complex that we are holding on to, resists any type of change in our life. You know that to be true, don't you? You know that to be true in your own life. And like a fractal, if we were to pull the camera angle back and we were to see our world any type of resistance to these kind of organizing principles we react violently against because of what we're covering up, because of what it means to us, because of what the uncovering might do to us. And so partly what I think we must do, and if we have the um, courage, and maybe it's not even the courage, maybe it's the weakness, Maybe it's just the giving upness of it to reach into this obscure cloud and we identify specific fears. For example, if I have to let go of my daily connection to food, then the question is, is what then will there be in the darkness for me? And that's the question, right? I have a friend, um, was always in relationship. I asked them about it one time. They said to me, I, I need another hand to hold before I give up this hand. Right? I mean, the darkness is really scary. And sometimes we need a hand to hold before we give up because the darkness um, tells us and defines ourselves. And so we cling to stuff that in the end whether it's food or relationships or power or struggle or shame, that promises something that it cannot deliver but gives us a trace of that nurturance. And so we walk around in these corpulent bodies where food promises to give us love. There's just a trace of it. I think so too of sexual dependency and ritualized behaviors of all that seem to offer continuity and connection in a deeply disjunctive world. And what spirit used to offer through tribal connection, through mythology, through us standing together in a deeper type of um, vulnerability of connection and tenderness, we must now search for many times as individuals amid all of this. And in the end, I think that there are two threats to our survival. This is not me. This is Young. This is Sister Lois. This is Jim Hollis. This is Bill Curley. There are two, uh, I think, forces. Um, we will all, uh, either feel overwhelmed or we will feel abandoned when we begin to look at these things. When we encounter being overwhelmed, um, there's a deep sense of powerlessness that comes up. We experience these things as, um, as children. And these are things that, um, and Erickson talks about the first stage of, um, of development where trust and mistrust is what um, a child is working out. I find this to be deeply interesting. This is nonverbal, pre-verbal stuff, folks. 
We are trying to work out before we have language. How do we trust? What do we not trust? Right? Before we have language. It reminds me um, of the African-American prayer that I often find myself praying. Um, the sea is so wide, my boat is so small. You pray that prayer, have you? You may have not prayed that prayer, but you get that, right? The sea is so wide, and my boat is so small. So no wonder there are so many freaking power strategies that we give ourselves to that show up in intimate relationships. I mean, who doesn't want to stake out some measurable, predictable, controllable thing in these relationships in the face of being overwhelmed? So we dig in, and then there's abandonment. In our culture, we are driven to achieve in order to be worth the accolades and the nurturance that we deeply want. And we seek out positions in life where uh, maybe there is kind of like a Pez dispenser um, approval and reassurance that is this structurally provided. You know, if I can reach up to here, then I get kind of some, um, some accolades. And so we don't know how to be free. We don't know what it would be like. Because what we want in the end of the day is matter. We need nurturance and sustenance. And so we give ourselves to systems that leave a trace of that in our lives. But it's not what we deeply hunger for. Or become addicted to a substance whose presence is easily managed, yet whose payoff and satisfaction progressively declines. This need to connect, to hold fast, to constrict, both in ourselves and others around us, is one of our most common human uh, patterns in reacting to change and discontinuity and ambiguity. I think this is why there is a rise in fundamentalism in our world and nationalism particularly white nationalism. Because when we begin to deconstruct those kind of power structures, when we begin to uncover what that really is about, the anxiety of being overwhelmed or abandoned, it's too much, and so the system reacts violently, and we come up with nutty little sayings. Make America great again. <laughs> All lives matter. Because the deconstruction of our own lives is too powerful. It's too, it's too uh, anxiety creating. <coughs> and so we begin to get a picture of why it is so difficult to get unstuck. Because unstuckness is not about what it is about, is it? It's what we don't see, what mobilizes defenses in our life, projections, fixations, objects, behaviors, images, practices, codes, institutions, dogmas, precisely because they offer some relief from the primal anxiety that everybody in this world, everybody that is around you, everybody that you will see today and tomorrow and this next week are facing. And none of us then is free of these kind of reflexive management systems these addictions, these compulsions. And what I mean by reflexive is that our response is automatic. Right? We feel the fear, the abandonment, the anxiety. And our response is automatic. It's not reasoned, it's not nuanced, it's not differentiated. It's full of rationalizations to defend the behavior that's in question. You begin to ask me about why I do certain things, I have a thousand reasons why. Right? Uh, uh, I'll even lie to you about what they're about. <laughs> I will. I know myself. I remember what um, uh, was a Stephen King, who said, uh, who's a recovering alcoholic, who said, uh, "I used to lie when I didn't need to be, uh, when I didn't need to lie, so that I could be in practice for when I needed to lie." <laughs> <laughs> when I read that. I thought that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> <All right. laughs> And it's typical that these management systems that we vow to replace or transcend um, 
It also explains that why they're so resistant to our wills. To replace the system will mean that either we replace them with other systems, perhaps even more pervasive and costly. I've seen a lot of people replace a, um, an addictive system with a hyper-religious system. It's just one system for another system. I've seen um, people do that in relationships. I've seen people do that in addictions. I've seen people do that with so many things. Because um, to stand nakedly before our own greatest threats of abandonment and anxiety is too much many times for us to handle. The sea is so wide. My boat is so small. And so to get unstuck, I think there's a couple things that has to happen. And this is not a four steps in your unstuck deal, because I'm working this out. I, I think most of us die stuck. And I think, I think that that's okay. I think that's the nature of things coming together and things falling apart and things coming together and things falling apart. that there are places in our lives that I think call of numinous of spirit is to continue to uncover the deepest fears in our life of being overwhelmed, of being abandoned, and facing those things. One of the things that uh, Jesus talks about is making friends with your enemies along the way. What happens when you find out that you are your own worst enemy? I used to think that hating myself would be enough to uncover why I did the things I did not want to do. It is not. Hate is just another management system. And I think that that's why a spirituality that encourages, um, calls out, invites a vulnerability where we can begin to um, talk to if we can, if not, draw, if not, express, if not, cry out these things that are underneath the substance of our life. That we become at peace. We have to make friends with those enemies of our own soul. Now we resist. We grow up. We become much more attuned to ourselves. We become much more attuned to a system where it's not a type of spirituality that's like I'm smoking a little pot and just saying, it's okay, man. It's really okay. Right? I'm not talking about that kind of spirituality. I'm talking about a type of spirituality that has some gravitas to it. That resists the type of things that we're doing in our culture to marginalize people. Where we produce hate in order to defend or to strike backs against hate. That we become a monster in order to defeat a monster. That's not what we're called to do. And so there's a type of spirituality that is baked, that is nurtured, that is um, saturated in a type of mystery. That calls forth not the right answers, but the beingness in front of the unbeingness. It calls forth presence in the front of and in the face of deep anxiety, and you will feel small. You will feel overwhelmed. And if Richard Rohr is right in that overwhelming sea, we somehow learn to breathe underwater. Because there is more to what um, we don't see than what we can see, and if that's true, there's more to spirit than what we can't see. That calling is deep within us. First of all, the things about letting go of things, um, um, the deep fear um, of what I think might happen to me, those things usually don't happen. Second, if um, they are to happen, then my hunch is, is that we could manage their happening. We could understand their happening. We can become a resilient person in the place of a defenseless, powerless child. And third, I think we have to go there. We have to go to that place. That place of fear, that place of rationalization, that place of um, deep complicity. 
and that we face those things as ways of becoming unstuck. And so what would it look like if we um, colluded with each other in our lives for unstuckness? Which meant that we'd have to collude in deeper vulnerability. We would have to collude in deeper mystery. We would have to um, collude in not having the right belief system, but in the right share system. And what if in that place, we're on each other's boats, always praying, the sea is so wide, my boat is so small. But still we say, still we love, still we resist, still we become all that may we might become in this world. Well, that's what I got. Okay, we run for the exits now. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I've got to be in the service uh, next week. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. You mentioned uh, a Buddhist who taught you how to meditate. What was her name again? Her name is Tara Brock. Uh, if you get on terabrock.com, as a lot of my friends will say, that Buddhism has taught me how to be a real good Christian. <laughs> uh, and so Tara Brock, I, I come naturally uh, in me with an anxiety disorder. Uh, I've struggled with pa uh, panic attacks uh, a lot in my life. I do not know why I speak in front of people. I mean, I'm wearing the pinned underwear right now. <laughs> uh, Maybe too much information. But, uh, and so what I've had to do is come up with a different system in my life that um, talks to that fear and that panic in a way that um, I, I wasn't trained or taught how to. And so when I talk about becoming friends with the enemies of our souls, that's a long process. That's not just a, you know, well, one-time surrender or whatever, right? That's a, that's a long, long, long walk for me. It'll be a walk I'll take the rest of my life. Tara Brock has taught me how to, how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. B-R-A-C-H. Depends underwear is why it takes us to the edge and be